welcome everybody. I'm Deirdre O'Burn from Five Leaves Bookshop and I'm very pleased to be welcoming A.M. Dasu and Alex Wheatle for our conversation this evening. And thanks for we start to Arts Council England who enabled our expert interpreter and it's um, Sandra Pratt. Sorry, have I got your name right? I'm sorry, I've lost my notes. I seem to have a um, a, um, a habit of doing this. Um, Ian Dasu is deputy editor of Words and Picture magazine. She's director of Inclusive Media, an organisation promoting inclusion and diversity in children's literature. And Boy Everywhere, her latest work has been acclaimed by, among others, The Guardian, Book Riot, Book Trust, CLPE, Amnesty, it's earned a Kirkus star and most recently shortlisted for Little Rebels Award. Um, she's used her publishing deal advances for Boy Everywhere to assist Syrian refugees in her city and has set up a grant to support an unpublished refugee, recently immigrated writer. Um, Alex Wheatle has spent most of his childhood in the notorious Shirley Oaks children's home near Croydon. And that has inspired several of his works. His first novel, Brixton Rock, was published to critical acclaim. And indeed, many of his subsequent novels have gained equal critical acclaim with Crompton Knights winning a Guardian Crit Children's Fiction Award. Um, the Humiliations, sorry, The Humiliations of Welton Blake, his most recent novel is a laugh out loud tale of disasters, and he'll tell us more about that. So how the event will happen is that, first of all, um, the readers will read from some of their work and tell us a bit about the book. And then we'll have a and a where I will ask them questions and then we'll throw it open to the audience. So, first of all, um. I read a Guardian review that said of teen fiction that um, readers of your age group, this middle to teen readers, they deserve big themes and big ideas. Um, could I start with you, A.M. Dasso, as could you tell us some of the big ideas that you have in Boy Everywhere without giving away too much of the plot and you're going to read something from the book? OK, hi, everybody. Um... So Boy Everywhere chronicles the harrowing journey taken by Sammy and his family and they go from privilege to poverty across countries and continents and it's a story of survival, of family, of bravery and it looks at the refugee crisis from a new perspective and through 13 year old Sammy's eyes it shows that we are all one cool twist of fate away from becoming refugees ourselves. It can happen to anyone and it, ref it humanises refugees it helps the reader build a connection to what they might experience. And it also explores bullying, um, cultural and religious diversity, discrimination, uh, immigration, overcoming obstacles, um, being a refugee, the impact of war, and of course, empathy, compassion, families, and how they cope with uncertainty and loss. Are you going to read something from the book for us, Sars? Sure. OK, so this is chapter one and I'm going to read from the e-copy on my screen, which is why I'm going to be staring at you guys. <laughs> um, so this is chapter one and this is where it all begins. And this is Sammy speaking. It all started going wrong during English. It was last lesson on Thursday before the weekend began. We'd just finished reading To Kill a Mockingbird and Miss Marjitha stood at the whiteboard going through some comprehension questions. I was scribbling them down, my head resting on my arm, when Layla tapped me on my shoulder from behind and handed me a note. Are you coming ice skating tomorrow? I'd started writing back when the door flew open and Mr. Abdo, our principal, burst into the room. I shot up from my desk the second he entered and straightened my shoulders. Everyone's eyes were fixed on Mr. Abdo, their faces blank. Pack your bags, you're all to go home, he said, rubbing the creases on his tired, worn face. See you back here on Sunday morning. We didn't need telling twice. Everyone sat their books shut and the room erupted in noisy chatter. My best friend Joseph turned to me and our eyes locked in confusion. Your parents and guardians have been called and are on their way to collect you, Mr. Abdo added, loosening the knot in his tie, his lips thin and tight, lines deepening across his brow. But why, sir? asked someone from the back of the class. There's been a bombing. This is not a drill, eighth grade. We need to get you all home. You know the protocol. A collective gasp rose from the room. 
Through the sash window, the sky was a clear blue. I couldn't see any smoke. Everything looked normal. The old orange tree stood firm in the sunlit courtyard. The gold crescent moon on top of the mosque's minaret gleamed in the distance. Behind it, the red, white and black striped flag on, on top of the church tower fluttered gently in the breeze. Cars were hooting their horns and the newspaper seller was still shouting out to people passing by his stall. Where had the bomb gone off? Panic prickled through me as I thought of home. I wish phones were allowed in school so I could just call to see if Mama, Baba and Sarah were okay. I grabbed my bag to get out my iPad, but remembered it wasn't in there. Joseph, get your tablet out, I said. I just want to check what's happened. I left my iPad at home. They won't have bombed anywhere near us, Sammy. Don't worry, said, uh, said Joseph, pulling his tablet out of his bag and swiping to log in. What shall I type? He asked, leaning in towards me. Google bombing in Damascus. After a second, he pursed his lips and said, nothing's coming up. He showed me the error message. The internet was down for the second time that day. My shoulders tensed. I quickly reminded myself that it was usually the outskirts of the city that were bombed. Most of Syria was torn apart because of the war, but no one had gotten close to Damascus. Your mama and Baba are at work, right? Joseph asked, his eyes focused on my forehead. I realised I was sweating and wiped the back of my arm across my face. Yeah, Baba's at the hospital, but mama, mama worked from home today because Sarah wasn't feeling well. They should be at the mall right now, I said, glancing at my swatch. She's picking up my football boots before the trial. Well, no one's ever bombed the centre. The government's always on high alert. Just chill, bro, said Joseph, lightly pushing his fist into my shoulder before turning to put his tablet away. He was right, but every time there was a bomb alert, I couldn't help but worry. Damascus is safe, I told myself. I took a deep breath, gathered my books and packed them into my bag while Mr. Abdo spoke to Miss Marshida. She had her hand over her mouth and looked like she was about to burst into tears. A backpack pushed past my arm, followed by another. Everyone was leaving. They're doing you a favour, Sammy. You weren't going to pass the English test later anyway. I turned to find George grinning at me, then pushing Joseph. Neither were you, sucker. Even at a time like this, George couldn't help being an idiot. Maybe it, was, maybe it was his way of showing he wasn't nervous like me, but it was so annoying. You're the one that's going to fail, loser, said Joseph, sticking his face into George's. George sneered at Joseph. Shut up. You're so fat. The only English letters you know are KFC. He turned to, he turned to me, raising his eyebrows and running his hands through his hair. So dumb, I thought. George still hadn't got over Joseph coming from a non-English speaking school. The class babble and sound of scraping chairs made it hard to think of a quick response, but I had to stick up for Joseph, whose cheeks were now the colour of tomatoes. I rolled my eyes at George. We'll see. KFC are still three more letters than you know. Did you stay up all week thinking of that one? His grin grew, so I added, should I use smaller words to make you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't the greatest comeback, but I couldn't think of anything else. George's mini fan club, which consisted of exactly two friends, tugged him away. Loser, I muttered as he left. Joseph and I joined the stream of kids leaving the classroom. Mr. Abdo was now speaking to Miss Marjorie at the door, but she stopped talking the second I drifted towards it. Joseph clutched his backpack, his head lowered. He was unusually quiet. Ugh, Georgie got into him again. You want to go to Dammers after, um, for ice cream after the trials? I asked to cheer him up. Yeah, of course, man, Joseph said, his eyes sparkling with excitement. Then we can go again tomorrow after ice skating, he grinned. Mr. Abdo marched past us. Hang on, I said to Joseph and ran up to catch up with him. Um, sir, we're supposed to be going to football after school. Where, what, where should we wait? I asked, wondering if Mama had collected my football boots. He picked up his pace and strode into the classroom next door to ours and started talking to the teacher inside. I shrugged at Joseph so, and, and as he caught up with me. We rushed down the central stairway of the school behind the swarm of students and flowed into the large reception area where our physics teacher, Miss Maria, was ushering everyone out of the side exit. I slowed down as I spotted Joseph's dad in a smart dark grey suit sitting on the deep button green leather sofa with his head in his hands. No one else's parents were inside, which was odd. The dark wood panelled walls where the president's portrait hung made him look even gloomier. Baba, said Joseph. His dad looked up. Oh, Sammy, come here. Joseph's dad stood up and reached out to hug me first. Weird. I went to him feeling awkward. And as he embraced me tightly, my heart began to race. He pressed my head against his shoulder and ruffled my hair, then released me and grabbed Joseph. I stepped back, feeling woozy from inhaling his strong aftershave. Right, let's get you both home, he said in Arabic, turning from Joseph. What about the football trials? I asked. Our driver is bringing my boots. I have to wait for him. Your barber asked me to pick you up. It's not safe to be out today. 
But Bubba, Joseph interrupted, we were going to get on the team today. This is so unfair. Joseph, I already told you it's not safe to be at the stadium. Joseph tutted, shoved the car forward, the door open and walked out. Thank you. I'll keep you updated. Joseph's dad shouted at the school receptionist as he followed Joseph out. I ran after him, my stomach lurching. Barbara wouldn't send Joseph's dad to pick me up unless it was serious. Maybe the bombing was really bad. Barbara would know because of all the casualties coming into the hospital. The street outside school was a the, the street outside school was a tangle of gridlock cars and beeping horns. Cars were double parked across the sidewalk, leaving hardly any room to walk between them. The newspaper seller pushed papers and magazines into our sides as we walked past his stall, desperately trying to get them sold while the street was jammed with people. We all got into Joseph's dad's Honda CRV and I pulled the seatbelt over me slowly, looking out at all the parents frowning in their cars. Joseph glanced at me and then pulled out his tablet. Can't believe they dropped bomb today of all days. I've been waiting ages for this, he muttered under his breath. I know, I said. I bet Abram's on his way with my boots as well. He's probably stuck in all the traffic now. What did you end up ordering, he asked, pressing play on a game. Can't get the night magisters in Damascus, so I got the added predators. Oh, nice. He looked out the window and then said, thanks for sticking up for me with George. His cheeks were flushed again. No worries. I'd never leave you to face that thug alone. George and his stupid gang had bullied Joseph ever since we started middle school. They thought they could do or say anything they wanted because they were all large Mussolini, kids of government officials. I'd never seen Joseph look so sad or alone as that first week in middle school, and I never wanted him to feel that way again. I'd always be there for him. It had always been Sammy and Joseph, and it would be forever. Ignore him, I said. He's just jealous of your skills. Still hasn't gotten over last semester when you scored that penalty. Joseph smiled. Yeah, that was awesome. Do you think they'll rearrange the trials for next week now? Yeah, probably. As Joseph went back to his game, I stared out the window, checking out everyone's cars. Layla's mama was in her great Lexus RX, but I couldn't see I couldn't see Layla through the tinted glass. Oh man. I realised I hadn't totally forgotten to reply to her note after Mr. Abdo walked in. I hoped I hadn't upset her. I'd message when I got home and tell her me and Joseph would be at the ice rink tomorrow at three. It took 20 minutes to get out, out of the school street behind all the other cars, but when we got moving, I could see the high-rise buildings were still intact. The roads were clear, traffic only building up the near, che near the checkpoints. There were a few fluffy clouds scattered in the sky. Something circled the blue far away, probably a helicopter. I still couldn't see any smoke in the air. They probably bombed the outskirts of the city, I reassured myself again. On the way to Joseph's neighbourhood, a crowd of people were gathered outside a big villa. The men in smart suits and the women in dresses, some wearing headscarves. But I was more interested in the cars they were standing next to. A black Bentley and a white Rolls Royce parked on the road. Both Joseph and I sat up to get a better look, our mouths open, practically drooling. Whoa, what do you think they're here for? I asked Joseph. Probably a wedding or a funeral, he said, showing me his game and smirking. I beat you, right? Hey, give me that. I said, grabbing his tablet and pressing play. We've been doing this for weeks. Joseph's dad parked outside their apartment building. As the car stopped on the smooth black tarmac, we heard what must have been gunshots in the distance. I always thought it sounded like rain hitting a tin roof, but it wasn't raining. We jumped out, sheltered our heads with our arms and ran through their black front gates. We raced up to Joseph's bedroom, throwing our bags next, out, next to some dried orange peel he hadn't bothered throwing away. I sat on the end of his bed while Joseph switched on his PlayStation and small flat screen TV. May as well, may, may as well play FIFA if we can't play the real thing, eh? He said, his chin jutting out because of his grumpy face. Yeah, may as well, I said, wishing the trials hadn't been cancelled and that we were showing off the skills we'd been practising in the stadium instead. There was a small knock on the door and it opened. Hi, you two. Do you want anything to eat? Asked Joseph's mama. Nah, said Joseph, still facing the TV screen, waiting for the game to load. How about you, Sammy? No thanks, auntie, but can I have a drink, please? Joseph's mama smiled. Sure, what would you like, Coke? Yes, thanks. Shall I call my mama to get Abraham to pick me up? He's probably waiting for me at school. No, she said quickly in a strange, high-pitched voice. Your barber wants you to stay for dinner. Stay there, I'll be right back with that Coke. She pulled the door up tight and left. I bit my lip and frowned. Even auntie was acting weird. I grabbed the remote from Joseph's hands and put it on TV mode. Hey, what are you doing? shouted Joseph. Shh. Just want to check the news, see why Barbara got us picked up, don't you want to know? Not really, all they'll show is more dead people. Oh, come on, it'll only take a minute. Go on then, said Joseph. I flipped through the channels one by one. Kids, cartoons, music, documentaries, news channel. My head started spinning as I read the headline flashing in red at the bottom of the screen. Damascus Sham City Centre Mall, Rebel Terrorist Bomb Attack. I sat staring at the image on the screen. 
The once shiny glass building was now partly rubble. The glass half of the moor was broken, was a broken grey shell and the concrete half was just barely standing. There were no windows or doors left in any of it and people in high-vis jackets rushed through the smoke, debris and rows of police cars and ambulances. I watched but couldn't move. My ears throbbed. I could see Joseph's arm waving around next to me. Everything had slowed down. The noise from the TV and Joseph's words muffled. I tried to say something, but nothing came out. The mall had been bombed. Mama and Sarah were there, buying my football boots. So that is when Sally's life is turned upside down and changes forever. Thank you very much, as, as I'm sure you all can tell, there really are big themes, big ideas coming out straight away. Well done. And Alex, can you give us a flavour of your book and read some of us? And again, without giving away too much of the plot. Yes, The Humiliations of Welton Blake. And um, I wanted to um, write something that was quite humorous because I'd just come off writing Cane Warriors, which is about um, a slave revolt in 1760 Jamaica. And that was quite triggering and quite traumatic. So... Um, basically, I just um, recalled my own difficult, um, sometimes awkward teenage years, and um, you might have a crush on somebody and so on. And so I just remembered all those days. And when I look back now, they were hilarious. But at the time when you're going through this, it's, um, it's agonizing, isn't it? And so um, Welton, he has this um, crush on this um, very nice girl at his school, but he has um, trouble expressing that. And um, he, he goes to school and he has the most really bad day. And, um, you know, everything he tries goes wrong and people are laughing at him. He has a detention as well. And then at home, his, um, his mum, um, she's about to announce that um, her boyfriend is moving in. And her, and her boyfriend has a son that he does not get on with. And so I pick up the story from there. The big announcement. When I got home, I took off my blazer, threw it over my bedside chair and crashed on my unmade bed. I closed my eyes and began to go over all the crazy events of the day. One thought came to my mind. Why am I so unlucky? A year or so ago, I was happily living in Ashburton. Back then, dad and mum weren't threatening to delete each other on the way back from the supermarket like they did when we arrived in Monk's Orchard. I had a busload of friends, got invited to lots of birthday parties, and I had many cousins to fling snowballs at. But my parents decided the only way they could afford to buy a house was if they moved out of Ashburton. So we ended up in Monk's Orchard, the most uncool part of the galaxy. On my first day at school here, with me coming from Ashburton, but then they realised I couldn't move with the best of them and I wasn't a boy soldier of an Ashburton drug gang and the guys laughed out their ribs at me. The girls ignored me. Soon after, Brian Broxlater started to tax me. Broxlater was my year's school bully. He originally came from the grimy ends of North Crompton. Everybody feared him. He wasn't that tall, just kind of thick and stumpy. He had legs like castle turrets, arms like giant German sausages, and he had a moustache at 12 years old. Well, it wasn't a full grown-up moustache, but you could see the hair follicles, outline and shadow. Because of his whiskers, everyone agreed that Broxlater was the baddest fighter in our year, especially as he was a Cromptonian. None of us had ever seen him fight, but the whole first year he went unchallenged. I mean, what idiot would try to fight somebody who already had a moustache? He stood on patrol at the school gates before registration and stepped up to kids like me and whispered, tax for the chancellor. One look at his moustache and his two fists would give him my jingles. At least I hadn't bumped into Brock Slater's taxing paws today. I had to be grateful for that. Now I was crashed on my bed. I was hungry. Not surprising after emptying most of my bodily contents into Karen Francis's hair. I hope mum has something in the fridge that I could heat up in a microwave. I got up and had a look. There was macaroni cheese on a plate from three days ago. 
if I didn't eat it a day after cooking, then why would I do so three days later? I checked the cupboards. There weren't any cheese and onion or barbecue flavor crisp there, only salt and vinegar. There were no custard creams either. I think I finished them off a couple of days ago. I had to settle for four slices of toast and two mince pies I found at the back of the cupboard. The sell-by date was long gone, but I didn't care. I poured a drink of flat coke and settled on the sofa, my mashed up ankle resting on a cushion to watch my favorite film, The Empire Strikes Back. I was monster munching into my second slice of toast while the 20th Century Fox fanfare announced my film was about to start when I heard mum coming in the front door. Are you home, Welton? Mum called. Welton, I'm in the front room, mum. Maybe she's got pizza. Pausing my film, I heard two other voices. Oh, Yoda, give me the force. No, mum's boyfriend Kingsley, who had branded Greyback because of his grey ponytail and his five-year-old demon son, Devon. The brat came running into the front room and jumped on my bad ankle. Welton, he yelled, while throwing his arms around my neck. Ah! I yelled, get off me, get off the strength to launch him into orbit. I would have done so. It wasn't something a Jedi Knight would say, because they're meant to be good with kids, but sweet Yoda, I didn't like, Le I didn't like Devon too much. Mum entered the lounge. She had a big smile on her face. Greyback had his right arm around her. He was grinning like he had won a Naboo starship or something. I couldn't see what Mum saw in him. I mean, Greyback was ancient. His hair was graying, obviously. He had ridges in his forehead, like you see in those wrinkly beef flavored crisp. He had hair in his ears and shaving bumps like mountains on his neck. I couldn't work out why mum wasn't worried that Greyback might be out on a date with her one night and just collapse and die of old age. I also couldn't work out how Greyback had managed to produce a kid at his age. I'd given this a lot of thought and decided that Greyback wasn't Devon's real dad. He couldn't be. Devon must be the satanic child of some prince of hell and Bernice Cummings' ugly aunt. Mum had told me that Greyback was much more mature than my dad. But what was the point of dating someone with more responsible if death was whispering to him? How was your day, Welton? Greyback asked me. I had the worst day of anyone who had ever lived, but I wasn't about to tell Greyback all about it. Not too bad, I replied. We made a decision, Mum cut in, unable to stop grinning. It was like her smile had a lifetime battery wired to it. What decision could this be, I wondered. Maybe they decided to send Devon to some far off boarding school on the other side of the universe. Kingsley and Devon are moving in with us for a while, Mum blurted out. I didn't quite reg at what Mum said. I sort of stared into space and lost all the feeling in my face. The throbbing in my ankle suddenly stopped and I had this out of body experience, like I was looking down at myself from the ceiling. I was beginning to think I had died. I tried to sit up, but my body wouldn't move. I couldn't move my tongue or my mouth. Things were struggling to pay the rent at his place. So I suggested he move in here with us until we can get somewhere bigger together. Makes sense, don't you think, Welton? Welton? I think I passed out for a couple of seconds, maybe a minute. This couldn't be. Greyback and the brat that even hell would reject were going to live with us. What had I ever done to deserve this 18 plus rated horror? Uh, what? I said, finally getting my mouth moving. How? What was that? Moving in? Our place is too small. Is Devin going to sleep on the couch? Don't be silly, Welton, Mum said. I have already ordered another single bed. Devin will be sleeping in your room. There's plenty of space in there. He'll be the younger brother you never had. I've seen how well you guys get along. <coughs> Devin bounced up and down on my bad ankle and I let out a real scream. <coughs> He's a lively one, isn't he? Greyback laughed, ignoring my pain. So full of energy all the time. I can hardly keep up with him. Because you're too old, I thought. Mum nodded. Yes, he is lively, she said, just like Welton was at his age. It'll be great all of us living together. It will give us a chance to save and get a bigger place. Who knows? Maybe we can go on holiday together. Jamaica. 
by sitting on a plane next to the brat for 10 hours. Ah! Devon had to go. We've ordered pizza for this evening, Mum announced, and we're going to sit down like a proper family to eat it. Greyback kissed her on the cheek. The brat bounced on my bad ankle yet again. I leaned in close to him. If you jump on my leg once more, I hiss, I'm going to wait till you're sleeping, take you up to the church spire and drop you onto the concrete head first. Do you know what will happen to your head after that? It will crack open and the inside of it will look like the pizza you're going to eat, but with added tomato sauce. The brat looked at me as if he was expecting me to laugh. I had my serious face on, like Luke Skywalker before he fought Darth Vader in The Empire Strikes Back. Dad, Dad, the brat wailed. Welton said he's going to drop me off the church and land on my head. He knows I was joking, I chuckled. I laughed so Mum and Greyback were really convinced I was messing around. I ruffled the brat's hair and he sort of smiled. Maybe 25%, not sure whether to trust me. Half an hour later, we sat down around our small table in the kitchen and had pizza. I made sure I got my fair share of garlic bread. I couldn't help but worry about what dad would make of Greyback and the brat moving in. He didn't even know that mum had a boyfriend. He always asked me if mum was seeing someone else and I would answer no. Living in his damn flat office alongside every species of spider, cockroach and fly has slowly turned dad insane. Well, not totally insane, but on some Saturday mornings, he didn't bother to wash, shave, get out of his pajamas or move from the couch. Even worse, I couldn't get the TV remote control out of his hands. I didn't want to add to dad's depression by telling him mum had a new boyfriend who seemed much more mature than him. I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderfully funny. Um, yeah, that's a really good sample of both of the books and they're great reads. I really enjoyed them both. Um, if I start with you, as thinking about the language when you're writing for this age group, what are the challenges? Because obviously you don't want to pitch it over their heads, neither do you want to patronise them. Can you tell me something about the process? Um, writing for children is so much harder than writing for any other audience because you need to be aware of their comprehension levels, their age groups, their interests. And children also want sort of fast paced um, stories that get going from the first chapter because you, they, you, know, you can lose their interest so easily. Um, but also equal to that, you have to figure out how to keep their, young, you know, their voice. So when editing, I had to ensure that my language was appropriate to that of a teen, that I didn't sound too young or too old. And when I first started writing, my authorial voice always slipped in, but thankfully my critique group and my mentor would pull me up on it. I also had to remove swearing and scenes that were too dark that would pull the story into a much older category. And because in Boy Everywhere, Sammy is Syrian, I had to research not just what a boy his age, age might be into, but how he might speak, um, but also, also, but also if, if that was true of boys in Syria. Um, so I researched what Sammy's interests would be to develop his motivations and his guilt. I learned what uh, Syrians, um, you know, how they speak, what sort of English they use. They use American English. So I was able to use words such as Gora, man, which my friend's son in Damascus does too. And then I double checked everything. Um, and whenever there was a word that would succinctly describe something in a scene, I had to ask myself if a 13 year old would actually think or speak like that. Um, I also watched lots of footage in which Syrian kids spoke about their lives, their hopes to live like normal children. So I was able to confidently write from Sammy's perspective. Um, and also a lot of inspiration came from, I've got two boys, so um, a lot of inspiration came from the sort of language they use as well. And then double checking it if, if it's realistic for children that, you know, are from Syria or in Syria. But yeah. And Alex also you're really good at nailing the voice and well mm -hmm. how would I know about the language but it seems like you've nailed it to me how do you go about this? Um, I'm very fortunate because for many years I worked in a youth club and um, I had all kinds of different characters and personalities to interact with and um, my young adults and children's content series really did and and sometimes um, it's not easy to um, keep up 
to date with modern uh, language trends and slang and so on. And so some of it, not all, but um, a small smattering of uh, with dialogue I created myself. Just so, um, so it would always be fresh, hopefully. So um, I've used um, poetic license there, but it's so fun because I really wanted to um, lose reader English that I like to describe it as because I think um, uh, my audience don't really want to hear that voice when they read that they can engage with something that they recognize. And so I'm trying to capture that kind of youthness, that, um, that kind of uh, tone that they um, will enjoy and have fun with. You know, rather than uh, adopt this kind of BBC English kind of uh, narrative that might turn them off. So, you know, you have to work hard on that. It's not easy to capture. It took me a long while. I mean, um, before I wrote a little bit, um, I had, I was trying to um, figure out for a couple of years or so to find the right tone and language because writing for uh, YA and children is a lot different to writing for adults. There are people who will say, and they used to say it to me sometimes when I worked in public libraries, this is not a suitable book for a teenager. And they'd come up and <laughs> I would say, yes, politely. And, you know, I <laughs> didn't agree with them, but they think subjects can be too dark, the topics are too upsetting or potentially... What would you say about that, Alice, given, you know, there are dark aspects to your story? I think it's so important uh, because children are affected by what happens in the news. It seeps into their perceptions, their conversations, and then sometimes their actions. Uh, children as young as 10 or 11 are exposed to what happens around the world. It affects them. They hear their parents talking or see it on news round, if not the main news, and they sometimes... Um, over here, their grandparents and research actually shows that children absorb values from their early years. Um, you know, it's Robert Winston's uh, show called, um, you know, in, in, on Channel 4. I don't know if you watched it, but a child of our time with four year olds, it showed that, uh, you know, where black and brown preschoolers believed that being white was superior. And that was just something that had ingrained, uh, you know, in them through the things that they'd heard and seen. Um, so, even though gatekeepers might believe that these subjects aren't for children, in reality, kids are exposed to discriminatory information and they need balanced and accurate representation so that they can come to their own conclusions and perhaps even feel empowered to bring change and improve the lives of their friends or peers being discriminated against. And I think books are the perfect way to counteract fake news and the constant bombardment of information via social media or whatever they hear, you know, th through the media or TV. And, you know, books are the best way to help young people walk in someone else's shoes and to see things differently. And if mm -hmm. we wait because we assume children are too young or shouldn't learn about, I don't know, far right ideology or racism or discrimination or, uh, you know, the treatment of refugees and the, and the impact on these people, we may be taking a risk that isn't worth taking. And those of us like, you know, Alex and I who have children, um, you know, are likely to experience discrimination or made to feel lesser. We don't have that luxury of waiting until they're old enough. We have to have those discussions with our kids as soon as possible. So I think that, you know, books can prompt questions and, you know, help have discussions. And sometimes mm. they can literally help save lives. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I find it um, mildly insulting as, and... I really do because I mean, just in the news in the last week, we've had that um, conflict, um, Israel, Palestine, and um, and sometimes what gets forgotten, what what gets forgotten in that narrative, is suffering trauma, and they have to experience these atrocities. You know, having to deal with um, a bomb uh, destroying your your house or your neighbourhood, with wh whoever sides it may be on. And um, aren't their experiences, aren't their trauma valid for them, for someone to write about that? And um, just, just like in um, Walton Blake, now he has um, problems at home trying to adjust to the, um, the new family situation of, um, of his mum's boyfriend, trying to adjust to get on with um, the boyfriend's son and so on. And in Kane Warriors, um, I'm depicting uh, a, young, a young teenager trying to deal with um, a slave revolt. And um, kids of all shapes and sizes throughout the years have to deal with these kind of situations. 
and their experiences are valid and it should be written about. And so I'm fearless in this way because I think those stories should be on paper. And so children today in a safe space in school or at home can learn about those experiences that kids have throughout history. I mean, uh, one of my great a young person was reading Anne Frank's diaries. I mean, who's to say, is that offensive to anybody? Writing material like that, writing a life experience like that. I mean, look how much good that has done to the world. Look how, how much understanding and empathy um, that was, that was a gain from writing a, a narrative like that. So I don't think that um, writers like myself or anyone should shy away from difficult issues and subjects. I think it enriches um, culture and uh, society, I really do. And uh, I, I strongly advocate that um, we do more so of that because you think about it, all the conflicts in the world um, and uh, atrocities and so forth, the, um, the kids' narrative is silent most of the time. It's usually about adults and uh, their losses and whatever, but no one really speaks about the child's tra tra uh, trauma and so on. So it's important for us writers like myself to fill in those gaps so people can understand as adults because often we forget the trauma of what children go through and I think having a book in your hands just like I I you know I was fortunate enough to have a book in my hands when I was a space uh, some sort of comfort some sort of place where I could escape and learn about other peoples and other countries and other situations that I could relate to that I can engage with you know so when I was seven eight nine years old I was reading Huckleberry Finn and I was reading about his his big his big black friend who uh, he sailed on a Mississippi River with along a raft, and I could have empathy with that situation because I wanted to escape my situation. So books about uh, those kind of issues and themes are so important. Both of you have young male lead characters in these books. We hear a lot about um, boys being alienated at a certain age. So you said you have sons as. Tell us about the importance of involving boys in your narrative. Um, it's an unfortunate fact that boys don't always connect with books with female main characters. In fact, they don't even want to pick them up in my house. Uh, so I wanted to write a book which would be relatable to all children, male, female, non-binary, who could simply relate to a boy who had lives like theirs and then had to adapt to losing everything. Um, and... I also chose to use my initials because I'd read that J.K. Rowling was asked to use hers because boys would be less likely to want to read a book by Joanne Rowling. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm aimed at Sue. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, I've seen it with my own boys who are feminists. They're really supportive of women, yet they still, you know, they've changed so much as they've gotten older and they will resist any book with a female lead. And it frustrates me, but it's, it is what it is. And it's becoming so much harder for me to for them to keep connected to stories and finish them when they do finish them when, when they do start them. And one of my friends, one of my son's friends, uh, he's uh, 14, 13, 13, 14, 14. And he picked up Boy Everywhere. He's a, he's dyslexic, dyslexic, he's a reluctant reader. And he was engrossed because there was a mention of bombing on page one. And because, you know, it's called Boy Everywhere. Um, and that was the feedback I got. Um, and I'm not sure why, but male characters come more easily to me. In fact, all my books, except one, um, has male uh, main characters. My daughter and I are outnumbered by men and boys in my family. So I'm surrounded by inspiration. Um, and Sammy was written from various observations in my own life and also from the accounts of refugees, of which so many are male in the UK. Um, and a lot of my own interests are stereotypically male, like I love cars. <laughs> so it was easier for me to write than if I was, for example, writing a scene about my character doing their hair or contouring makeup, because trust me, I can't do those things well myself. <laughs> what about you, Alex? Have you come across this reluctant reader syndrome with boys? Yes, I have. But um, when I explain to them, when I go into schools and uh, colleges and so forth, that um, still claim that you don't read. I said, okay, what do you do when you go home? They said, oh, am I um, what's something on Netflix? I might uh, play a game on a, uh, one of these um, game consoles or whatever. And, um, you know, they might engage, you know, all the time they're engaging in storytelling. And so I questioned that. I said, look, stories are all around you and you engage with it on a daily basis. How can you say that you're not... Um, that you're not a reader or you're not engaged in storytelling because 
And when they realise that, it's like, oh, as is right, Mo, it's very hard to engage a young boy with a, a female leading a story. But um, in my career, I purposefully uh, tried to um, write girls or women's narratives. I mean, I did that um, as long ago as 2006 with Island Songs with two sisters growing up in Jamaica and finally arrive in the UK. I've done that in the Crompton series with Homegirl and Straight Outta Crompton because I believe that their narratives in somewhere like Crompton, my fictional Crompton, is just as important as any male. Look out my window when I live in South London and I see uh, kids uh, on a bus or going home after school or whatever. It's girls and boys all the time. So how can I leave one gender out? It just doesn't make sense. So for me to be a complete writer, I have to write both the narratives and anything in between. It just makes perfect sense to me. It's like, you know, I live in London and uh, or I could live in uh, anywhere, any major city in the UK. And what do I see in front of me? I see brown people. I see black people. I see people in between. I see all kinds of shades. So why wouldn't I consider um, including those people who I see on a daily basis in my narrative? It's in Crompton Nights. Um, I have a, a Muslim character because I see Muslim characters every day in my life. You know, I interact with them, I have lunch with them, they're my friends, so why wouldn't I consider that? It just doesn't, you know, it doesn't occur to me that I would omit them from a total narrative that I'm trying to create if I'm depicting a major inner city in the UK. So for me, I've always included, I've always been inclusive with my characters, or I try to be anywhere, and I try to do it to the best of my ability. And sometimes I have to ask questions, ask her, okay, what it's like to be a, a 13, 14 year old girl? What thoughts swirl about in your head? And um, that was a that was an eye opener, I can tell you. So I'm learning all the time. <laughs> you answered my next question. I was thinking about the, the importance of representation, but you both have actually talked about that. Um, I'm going to ask one question before we go to the audience, because I realise we're running out, but we have covered an awful lot in what you have said. Um, you said, Alex, you read Huckleberry Finn when you were growing up. Do you remember any of the other books you read? For me, you remember reading Huckleberry Finn. That was um, a book that was discarded on a dormitory floor at a children's home that I was reciting. And also um, Treasury Island. I reread that book something like seven, eight times, probably even more, because that was the only, that was the only text available to me. I mean, um, I grew up in comics, and um, people kind of um, look down at comics, but I'll tell you something. When I was five, six, or seven, those discarded comics on the dormitory floor, that is how my reading ability accelerated enormously. And so despite all the troubles that I had in secondary education and so on, what saved me is that I was always usually the best that they put me in. It, and it was because that I started very early reading comics. So I was self-taught in a way. So that was very important for my development. Alice, do you remember what you read when you were young? Oh, God. Whenever I'm asked what my favourite book was as a child, I can only ever remember the picture book where Spot. I really loved it. And I read it till I was way too old for it. I even had a so Spot the Dog soft toy that I carried around everywhere with me. Um, and, but as I got older, I loved Funny Bones, The Jolly Postman. And then there's this huge gap because I just can't recall any books I read until I got to secondary school, of which my favourites were Brave New World and Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which I read with my teacher. And I was just astounded by both because we really explored them, which is why I think it's really important to have texts read in schools because through discussion, you gain so much more. Um, and then recently, when my mum was moving house, um, she bought um, a box down from the attic and it contained all my school books. And I found this diary in which I'd started writing a list of my favorite books and judging by my writing I was probably aged eight here and I apparently I loved the worst kids in the world and Charlotte Cheatham and I don't remember those books at all <laughs> I'm glad I wrote them down um, but you know like Alex was saying like gr growing up I didn't seek to see anyone like me in books or magazines I'd never experienced it so I never expected it and so I turned to tv shows in which I saw black or Hispanic characters which I could relate to I didn't ever see accurate representation of anyone from my own background. And sadly, I don't really see much of it now, not in a positive, not in positive rep anyway, um, although it is improving. Um, but, you know, that's why, like Alex, I wanted to show lots of different types of characters in my stories because 
when you see yourself in a story, it gives you a sense of belonging, a sense of place, and you feel valued. And it was really important to me that readers could see through a window in my books that, as Alex said, is like true life, as, as, as you would see in your local Asda or Tesco or in the streets. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, that's why it's important to me that books represent um, all sorts of people and all sorts of stories as well, because I've learned so much. Um, you're in, uh, books are, as Alex was saying, stories are everywhere. But in so many things where we experience stories like gaming or movies or TV shows, you are um, experiencing them from the outside. Whereas in a book, you, it's, it's completely different because you are immersing yourself as the character. You're seeing that situation through a character's eyes. Um, and so you really do have a sense of understanding of what this person is going through or their culture or just their experience. Um, but yeah, I, books, I had access to lots of books, but my memory's like a sieve. <laughs> See, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box because of the chat box, I won't see them. Let's see what you asked. Um, Darren asks, to what extent do you feel children's publish publishing really has its heart in improving diversity in books, opposed to just tick boxing and following trends? How far do you feel we have left to go? Hmm. I think um, children's publishing in the UK have made great strides, actually. 15 years ago, there was probably, to my memory, only Mallory Blackman who was writing narratives with um, children of colour. Um, now, uh, if you look in the last two years, there's many more writers of colour being published, many more diverse books being published, not just about um, different um, races or creeds, but... Um, uh, boy, girl, and anything in between. And I think that's really heartening to see. And so now uh, children's librarians in schools and um, public libraries across the country can now offer a selection of books that hopefully can be appropriate for any child. And so we're, we're you know, we're trying to reach that point where every child can um, be catered for for whatever interests they have, whatever background they have. And, you know, we're getting there um, a lot quicker than we were 10 years ago. So that's very encouraging. You know, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be part of this new movement, if you like. And, um, you know, to see uh, writers like As come forward and do so well and be nominated for so, for so many awards. Patrice Lawrence won the, um, the Jalek Prize the other day. And so it is great to see because we have so many stories to tell in the diverse community or any other community you know and at last it's given it's been given rain and hopefully long may it continue how do you feel about publishers um i think i think alex is right this they're making such an effort and there's been a lot of improvement i think the main thing we need to now make sure is that diverse groups is niche or other or special um, and that they are just seen as for what they are, just stories um, that we all enjoy and engage in. Um, I think that's the next hurdle really. And also I think that we really need to, um, I think sometimes publishers are risk averse. So they sometimes don't want to take on stories because they think they won't sell because they're too niche, because they think they're niche. Um, or because they think that people won't connect to them. And to be honest with you, you just don't know what people are going to connect to. Like, you know, when Boy Everywhere was on submission in its first mm. submission, uh, you know, people were like, oh, I'm not sure about this. They say, oh, oh, sorry, we've got a refugee book on our list kind of thing. And I went away and um, mm. uh, edited it. Um, but, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't know how to, is it Chimini? I can't remember her name now. But, you know, when she, she talks about, I should let me Google her name quickly. I'm going to say her name properly. I'm wasting time, I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, she says, she talks about the um, danger of the um, single story. And I think that's what we've got at the moment, where people think that if you publish, if you've published one black story or you've published one Syrian story or one Muslim story, you've covered bases. But we are, I mean, own voices means one voice 
nobody mm. experiences life the same not one you know, everybody experiences life differently and so we've all even if Alex and I went through a bombing the way he'd experienced that bombing would be completely different to the way I'd experienced that bombing mm. so they are two different stories and they're still equally engaging and interesting I think we do need to recognize that it's not just about, in terms of ticking boxes I think it's it's not just for having one story because how many stories have we got where children unrealistically are allowed out run off in the woods have an adventure parents don't miss them you know mm. we have lots of those so we can have more of the other kind too <laughs> yeah I think so again oh yeah you mentioned aspects of editing that meant darker moments were removed otherwise the text would move to a different age category do you ever feel that publishers or the editing process removes any aspects of authenticity of the refugee experience that you are keen to capture um for young readers as well as in regards to the activism aspect um so in terms of I had to take out dark. This is earlier on. So um, when I would, when I first written Boy Everywhere, and um, it had started off as a YA, um, and my voice is just I, I can't write YA. <laughs> I write young a young voice. So um, I was told that this is you know middle grade's really doing well at the moment, and um, you should totally write this as a middle grade. It will work as a middle grade. Your voice is young, and that's why I had to take out the dark scene. So we had. Um, you know, uh, uh, some sort of druggies uh, on the boat that he recognised. We had more violence. But in terms of editing this middle grade version of Boy Everywhere, um, there was a knife scene. So, for example, I had to take the knife out of uh, the detention centre because that's just not acceptable in middle grade. So instead of having the knife, um, uh, you know, sorry, spoilers, but you have, um, he uses his arm the person that you know, holds him hostage. Um, so yeah, I couldn't use violence. I had to take out swearing, obviously, um, for middle grade. And it was okay. Like when I was first told to take out swearing, I was like, how do I make, how do I, I couldn't think of how to express that emotion that Sammy was feeling. Cause he'd used the F word and, oh no, Hassan had used the F word. And then it took a couple of goes. And I realized that he just needs to say, go back to your own country in capitals and that is just as offensive as F off. Mm. <laughs> and literally it takes, so for me, I was grateful because it took somebody pushing me to think. It wasn't, nobody told me what to do, but they said, better not to use this language. So I had to then go away and really challenge myself and come up with a better option. So I appreciated that, to be honest, because I was literally able to convey the same thing but in a better way. <laughs> so, yeah. Alex, I mean, you've written about care homes, bullying. I mean, there are so many dark aspects. Have you ever been asked to tone that down in your books? Me? Um, not really. No, I've been given free. Um, what I wanted to uh, produce on the page has made it into print. Um, so again, uh, in Kane Warriors, there is some violent scenes there, but um, the editor was uh, very supportive and she insisted that those scenes be made in because otherwise uh, the reader's not going to get the full horror of what happens to my characters. So it's very important that that is included. I mean, obviously, uh, I try not to be as graphic as maybe I might have been if I was writing for adults, but nonetheless, uh, you know, there's scenes of it and there's no skirting that. Obviously, I'm not going to spend um, a paragraph describing um, the way someone is killed. It might be a line or two, but uh, the reader is left in no doubt of what happens. And I think you have to do that. Otherwise, what's the point of me writing a book if I'm going to omit those kind of scenes or that kind of, um, that kind of scenario? It's, it's, you know, I, I just have to include it. So um, I've been pretty untouched, to be honest. You know, uh, I never had an editor who said, no, Alex, you can't have that. You can't I mean, it's amazing um, in, in YA that um, you can kill somebody, but you cannot have the characters have sex. <laughs> you know, so I find that a bit strange. 
but uh, those seems that seems to be the rules. I mean, it, um, I remember Melvin Burgess, uh, his great book. What's it called? Um, can somebody remind me? What's it called? Junk or something? Yeah, junk. Uh, and and then there was a bunker diaries. I mean, there is um, incredibly vivid um, violent scenes in those narratives, and so YA has always um, had that within itself. Shy away, especially if the story demands it. I mean, in Welton Blake, for example, it doesn't demand that kind of um, vivid violent scene because it's a fun story and I want young people to enjoy it. But whatever the story demands, I will try to serve that. And following on from that, actually, um, when editors have questioned something in terms of authenticity, I've just said, no, actually, this is how it is. And they, that's fine. And they, they, accept, mm. they accept that. So it's not that, you know, they won't, they won't push you. They, they, they respect that you know what you're talking about. Mm. Um, yeah, so one comment and then one last question. Um, Darren says, I really love the fact that both Boy Everywhere and Kane Warriors didn't feel like they were pulling any punches, even with any editorial compromises that may have been made. Nikki says, Alex, would you consider writing for slightly younger children, eight plus? Well, Welton Blake, I would say, is that age group. Um, but um, what about collaborating or writing on a graphic novel? I mean, I was wondering that about both of you as well. Would you yeah. think about a graphic novel, Alec? Funny enough, I've been considering it for quite a while now. Um, a middle grade or even younger, into uh, six years upwards of uh, writing a simple story with an illustrator. Um, my son is an illustrator, so um, when he's less busy, we might well do something together. Um, writing a story that he can uh, illustrate. Uh, wouldn't that be great? Um, uh, written by Alex Wheatle, illustrated by my son Marvin Wheatle. That'd be an incredible moment, wouldn't it? So um, absolutely, um, I'm thinking about that. I'll just have to find the right story, find the right tone. And uh, yeah, that would be quite enjoyable for me, I think. It's, um, I thought I could um, write for middle grade, but hopefully I've done that with um, Wilton Blake. And um, so it's something I want to, because we have to encourage readers of all ages, and it's a challenge for me. Uh, writing YA wasn't easy for me. You know, I had to uh, adjust and learn. And so hopefully I can improve my learning and write for an even younger age group and illustrate it as well. That'd be fantastic. That would be awesome. <laughs> We're waiting for that now. So you have to tell Marvin to think up some ideas. <laughs> yeah. Do you consider a graphic novel, do you think, as My kids actually, want, uh, they constantly, they assume that they can contribute. So they're like, can I oh. do a cover, mummy? I know. It <laughs> doesn't work like that. But yeah, I, um, I, I do want to uh, write younger books because um, it's really hard writing a novel. You know, Boy Everywhere is a big book. It's 73,000 words. It's e equal to a YA book, really, in terms of length. And it just takes years to edit, it's so hard. I mean, Alex knows, right? Nobody talks about yeah, how hard it is. Very right. hard. So hard. And um, I just want to write sort of shorter stories that are easier. There's a there's a quicker end, an easier edit. Um, so I've written some young fiction recently, and I'm hoping to write more. Uh, there's potentially a picture book coming as well. Um, so yeah, there is younger mm. fiction coming for me. Graphic novels, I really need to look in more because I don't read them as often myself um but yeah I mean I'm up for anything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> except YA no way <laughs> it's been else. great because I mean the blurred boundaries because some people think YA starts around 10 and I mean I I think the distinguish the distinguishing kind of line of 7 to 12 and calling that middle grade or tween makes more sense because it is very different to what yeah. you can do as Alex says you know the world's your oyster really apart from sex maybe but there are people who blur that boundary as well like Louise O'Neill asking for us um it's been great talking to you and I really wish we had another hour it's been absolutely amazing and thanks for your great readings and thank you very much Sandra for your signing and for Arts Council England of course for um paying are funding this series, Pippa for organising and Simon for very solid technical support. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. And um, may I add my thanks 
to Sandra for signing this. So first for me, and it's um, very important in this Zoom Zoom age, isn't it, that um, someone like Sandra can sign for um, viewers. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I echo that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.